Hey Warriors, thanks for joining me for another episode of the Disabled to Enabled podcast with me, your host, Jesse Ace. Today's episode is sponsored by our friends at iHerb, supplements at an affordable price. Go to mmini.me slash iHerb or mmini.me slash iHerb or click the link in the show notes. Check out the supplements that I take on there too in my recommended supplement section. By clicking this link, I hope we'll give back to the Disabled to Enable podcast and you get some awesome supplements at a great price. My name is Jessie Ace. I'm part of a group of enabled warriors that you've probably never heard of. We're fighting back against our invisible illness and taking the dis out of disability. We don't give sympathy to our symptoms. They enable us to be the warrior that we are. If you asked doctors and nurses, they'd say what we're doing is impossible. But pushing the limits of our conditions is something that we have to break through every single day. We push the limits. We are mentally strong. And we can do anything. The question is, how far can we push those limits? This podcast will give you the answers. I'm Jessie Ace. And this is the Disabled to Enable podcast. So speaking of being a chef, um, before your diagnosis, I read that you were at college wanting to become a paralegal. So how on earth did you make the switch from being a paralegal to a chef? How did that happen? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I went to college with the, with the goal of finishing college and going to law school. And when I graduated college, I started working at a law firm. and um, I was studying for the LSATs in my spare time, the, the test to get into college, to get into law school. Um, you know, and then, and then the illness happened, the, the numbness and, um, you know, my life went off on this incredibly horrible tangent. And um, when I fixed things or started to fix them, I started working in the law field again. And, um, you know, truth be told, like I was, I was, good at it but I didn't like it I didn't like it at all um I'm not I'm not an office person um I don't like I don't like having to comb my hair I don't like having to put on a suit and tie it's just not my it's not my thing yeah I don't like to shave um you know and um you know one day I came home from work um and my wife was there and um I said to her, I said, I know money's tight and I know that we need this income, but I have to try and become a chef because if I don't try and do it, um, I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. You know, and she just looked at me and she said, I'll pay the bills. Um, you know, go do what you have to do. Like, uh, you know, it's your turn to try, you know, you've earned it, you know, you've worked so hard. Um, and go ahead and try it. And, um, you know, I, um, I wound up uh, finding a kitchen that was desperate for a chef and had no money. So they were willing to take on somebody with no experience to be a chef there. And, um, uh, they couldn't pay me, but, um, so for six months I worked for free as a, as a chef. And it turned out to be like my culinary school that I didn't have to pay for. So working for free actually wasn't That's that bad. Awesome. I worked out well. Yeah, it worked out well. It was very difficult because I had no idea what I was doing. I, I knew how to cook, uh, you know, um, but as far as everything else that goes into being a chef, I had no idea what I was walking into. And it was a very, very difficult process learning how to actually do this for 50, 60 people a night. It was really, um, it was a lot of fun, uh, but it was also very, very difficult. Yeah, I can imagine because like, I mean, I, I've, been, I've only seen like um, kitchens on TV kind of thing, <laughs> you know, like Gordon Ramsay and stuff like that. And I can't imagine being in the middle of that for so long, especially with MS, because it's, it's like the hottest place on earth. I swear being in the kitchen anyway. <laughs> but, like, well, the adrenaline helps a lot. You okay. know? The adrenaline really helps. Um, and actually, it's kind of strange. Um, the heat of the kitchen doesn't bother me. I can't go out in the sun for more than five minutes. What'd you say? I said, you lucky thing. Yeah, I, I, but I can't go out in the sun for five minutes. If I sit in the, in a summer day in the sun 
for five minutes, I can't move the next day. But the kitchen, you know, maybe it's the adrenaline, maybe it's a different type of heat. I don't know what it is. Um, I asked my doctor about it and she said, um, you know, it's gonna, it, it's gonna make your existing symptoms a little bit worse for the time that you're in the heat, but it's not gonna hurt you anymore. So I said, okay. And, um, you know, there are days where, you know, I drag and it's, it's difficult and I'm, I'm sitting there waiting for the rush to come in so I can get that pop of adrenaline and get my energy back. So probably every day about six or seven, I'm just like, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it through tonight. And then snap, it comes in like clockwork. The people come in and I'm ready to go and uh, you know, let's, let's do this kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, let's do this. That's I know, I know it's a little bit different, but it's kind of, kind of like when you're supposed to go on an <clears throat> sorry when you're supposed to go on a night out and you're sitting there at home and you're like, oh, I'm all comfy, I'm all warm, I don't really want to go. And then as soon as you're there, it's fine and you can stay there all night. But it's that it's that thought of going, oh, I've got to go and do something. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. It's you know, I guess the brain has a much larger effect on our physical well-being than we think it does. Yeah, mind over matter, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot to that. <laughs> For sure. So what was it like taking part in, a cook, in, in the cooking show Chopped for the Food Network? Like, that, that is so cool. What was that like? <laughs> that was uh, next to the birth of my son. The, the first time I was on the show was probably, you know, the best moment of my life. Um, yeah. You know, I the the it was a special tournament, and Alton Brown was the the guest of the tournament. You know, and it was all about him and food science. And um, since he, you know, came on the scene um, 15, 20 years ago, he was sort of the person I looked to. If you want to use the word idol, I I looked at him, and you know, I just love the guy. I've seen every one of his television shows episodes, every single one of them, five, six, seven times. I've bought all of his cookbooks. And Chopped was also my favorite cooking show. Um, wow. It was my favorite one and one of my favorite shows. Uh, and I watched it before I became a chef. Like I was every single Tuesday night, I would make sure I was home to watch it. And so now it was like walking into a dream. It was like, um, you know, I remembered as I was walking into the studio, I'm like 10 years ago, I was sitting on my couch at my lowest point in my life, mm. um, just wishing that I could have something different and watching these people on TV and saying, how lucky are these guys? They get to be chefs all the time and they're on this television show. And that's what I want to be. And if I could make a wish right now, it would be to trade places with one of these guys or to not trade places, but to be on the show. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, 10 years later, I'm walking into this studio and I'm like, wow, I'm like, how, how did this even happen? This is, <laughs> you know, this is like the exact, this is nowhere near anywhere that I thought I would be 10 years ago. And um, I'm standing 15 feet away from my idol and I'm about to cook him dinner. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, it was just, I tried to soak in as much as I could in the beginning before the cooking started because I knew once the cooking started I was just going to be cooking and I wasn't going to be realizing where I was and then and then it was just about you know you forget that you're on tv because now you're just cooking and then the moment when I won the tournament I won fifty thousand dollars I rem I just you know the thoughts that were going through my head is like this is life-changing this isn't like you know this is like I'm my life just totally is different than it was two days ago. This is amazing. Uh, and it was uh, just an amazing, amazing feeling. And being on the show was so much fun. They're really great people over there. Um, the judges are a lot nicer than they look on TV. <laughs> you know, they really are. And, uh, you know, um, I got, got to meet some great people. I got to make some great friends. And, uh, you know, the whole experience from top to bottom was just amazing. The only thing I would say that I didn't like about it is that you have to be at the studio at 5.30 in the morning. Ugh. Yeah, and I'm not a morning person. Yeah, I'm not yeah. a morning person. Yeah. <laughs> not That's friend. far too early. Wow. Was it a kind of application process to actually get on the show in the first place? Or were you like chosen because they'd been to your restaurant or something? Or No, it's an that? application process. You have to... Uh, you know, there's a questionnaire that's like 
45 pages long and oh, gosh. <laughs> you have to you have to sell yourself right so yeah. you know I'm not gonna lie I use the MS to sell myself a little bit to get on the show um, and I, I think I applied probably seven or eight times uh, you know over the course of uh, over the course of five or six years I just would apply every you know six or seven months um, and then I was in Florida and or not in Florida, I, I got an audition or yeah, you go to the studio basically to meet them in person because they have to see what your personality is. Mm. And it was the day after my son was born. Oh, wow. So I was exhausted and um, I didn't make a good impression on them or I made, I made a slight impression on them. I didn't get a call to be on the show, um, but I expressed my love for food science. And then, you know, six months later when they had a food science show, that's when I got the email. Um, I think me and my wife were, we were in Florida at the time and I got the email, it was around Christmas time and we were jumping up and down. It was just like the most exciting thing. It, I got the email at like 11 o'clock at night. So we were, I think we woke up everybody in the house. We were so excited. <laughs> That's worth it though, isn't it? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. So I heard as well that you, um, you're quite an inventive chef and you don't yeah. quite do things by norm so, so what kind of things do you did you like to did you do on there um i like to one of my favorite things to do is to take really traditional food and just do it in a totally weird untraditional way that sounds uh, awesome. it's kind of like you know i kind of have fun with food you know i like to say that my restaurant gives fine dining the middle finger because we do fine dining food uh, we use the highest quality ingredients and and you know state-of-the-art techniques but we do it in a fun and whimsical way um, and it's sort of the vibe of a restaurant where you come in and you have fun and you're basically eating you know you're eating fine dining food but it's not this stuffy sit down and you know silverware changed all the time and you can't talk and all of this nonsense it's just a fun time and nice I have, I have no problem putting you know potato chips oh, we have potato chips on our menu we have this beautiful duck dish with an artichoke puree and a demi-glaze and all this fancy stuff and then you can get that with a side of potato chips that are fried in duck fat so oh perfect <laughs> <laughs> you know it's just a fun thing and we do anything with the menu um i'm really into food science so we incorporate a lot of that into our cooking um i like to study uh, why food does what it does when you do something to it so I don't follow recipes. I, I use techniques to make different things. I like to know why, you know, searing the meat affects the flavor the way it does and, and things like that. I like to understand the chemistry behind, behind food and the physics behind food. That's physical fascinating. Science. Yeah, it is. It is probably, science, like, a chemical reaction. Yeah. Isn't it? It's amazing. It's probably the first science that human beings ever did on this planet. They realized that if we cook meat, it tastes better, you know? and kills bacteria and all this stuff you know it's incredible and i'm amazed that it's not more widely taught at schools in that sense as well it's not just like a, a cooking lesson but it's like the science behind the food that should mm -hmm. totally be in schools it absolutely should be because i see i, I don't want to bash culinary schools but i see a lot of people come out of them and they're they're almost like robots like yeah. well this is how i was taught to make this sauce and this is how you have to make it and this is the only way in the world you could possibly make this sauce when really you you can make it a lot of different ways there's a ton of different ways that you can make it that are a lot easier if you understand why the food is doing what it does when you do something to it totally. i know that was a lot of do's in one sentence but, <laughs> but that helped me on on chopped because I was able to make things on chopped in five minutes that would traditionally take 15, 20 minutes to make. And I can make them in five minutes because I understood why the food does what it does when I apply heat to it or when I, uh, you know, apply heat in a certain way or I apply a type of chemical to it. And I know chemical scares people when you're talking about food, but everything in the world is a chemical. Water is a chemical. So, so, so have you got any kind of hacks for us to make our cooking easier and quicker? Is there anything that we could be applying at home? Anything you could be applying at home. Um, well, there's, there's a certain, um, I think they're, they're selling them now pretty widely. Um, they're called immersion circulators. The type of cooking is referred to as sous vide cooking. 
and um, they're like $150 now. It's basically a machine that sets a temperature for water, and the oh, food is similar. put into a bag, and it's put into the water, and it cooks the food to the temperature exactly that you want, and it won't go over or under. Um, and um, I mean, it gets really complicated. There's a time and temperature chart that's involved, but you don't really need to know that stuff if you, you know, there's recipes all over the internet. So somebody that doesn't know how to cook that wants a medium rare steak can set the machine to 133 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm sorry for your European listeners who do it the correct way. I don't know the <laughs> Celsius for that, but you can set it to that and um, you're going to get a medium rare steak every time you do it, whether you know how to cook or not. I bought one for my wife. She uses it quite often. Um, she loves it because she doesn't have to worry about it. Mm. And it's a small investment. It, there's so many kitchen gadgets now, The um, not to give them an advertisement, but what is it called? There's like a little mini pressure cooker now that does like rice and the magic pot or something like that. It's amazing, the uh -huh. technology that's available now yeah, um, totally. for home cooks. It's um, it's uh, it's annoying. It's annoying for chefs because like, you know, we used to do all this stuff and it was kind of our, our domain and now home cooks are able to do it. So, oh, <laughs> gosh. So in terms of our math specifically, like, is there anything that makes your life easier when you cook at home? So like, for example, I use my hot pot thing a lot. Um, I guess I can't remember what you call them in the States. Uh, crock pot? Oh, what do you call them? Crack, yeah, that's the one, crock pot. Um, I use that all the time because it's so much easier. I can just kind of put everything in it and then leave it to when I need it. Yeah. But, well, I mean, the I make it easier to cook at home by not cooking at home. That's my cook. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> my wife's becoming quite a good cook, so she takes care of a lot of that now. Nice. So, okay, before we go, before we go into all of the, you know, fun questions at the end, um, we have a question from our Enabled Warriors group, and Joanna wanted to ask you, do you have any suggestions for quick vegetarian meals for the days when you're just too exhausted to cook, but want something reasonably healthy too? All right. I have actually two, two suggestions. One is for if, if you want to buy stuff and have it in the refrigerator and the other one is for leftovers. So mm -hmm. um, I, I personally love mushrooms and for vegetarians, if you're a vegetarian, I don't know how you can't love mushrooms because it's kind of as close as you can get to meat without being meat. Um, <laughs> You know, just a simple saute of mushrooms over a piece of toast with butter on the toast. And then, you know, you can finish it with olive oil or you can make uh, what's called a bermonte, which is basically a little bit of water that you whisk butter into and pour that on top. And you got a delicious meal that takes about 10 minutes to make. Just make sure if you're going to do that, use a very hot pan um, and put the mushrooms down and let them sit there and get brown. Don't move the pan. Let them get brown. And don't put salt on them until the end because ah. you want to get that caramelization. And you go back to food science, salt draws moisture out. So you don't want to salt them until the end. That's a delicious one. And then just a really quick meal. Um, if you've got leftovers in your refrigerator, something I do at home when I do have to cook at home, especially for my son because he loves them. I have a bag of flour tortillas always available in my house. And I basically put flour tortilla, some cheese. Unfortunately for your health nuts, processed cheese works better than regular cheese for this. <laughs> cheese and then any leftovers I have in the refrigerator. So if you're a vegetarian, I'm sure you got some broccoli and cauliflower and whatnot that's maybe cooked from leftovers from the day before. Yeah. Um, put that in and uh, you know, cook it in a saute pan and a little bit of oil in a saute pan, brown both sides, melt the cheese. And you have a delicious quesadilla that takes about three minutes to make. I basically eat them with hot sauce and sour cream. And if you want to get super ambitious, you can make a salsa with it. But I'm a, I'm a sour cream guy. I do love a good hot sauce and sour cream combo, I've got to say. Yeah. Oh, it is. What one. kind of hot sauce do you like? Ooh, I'm in a, I'm in a sriracha mood at the moment. So sriracha? I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to oh. do bottles of it. Just like, you know. I'm a Frank's hot sauce guy myself. Oh, okay. Awesome. Where where does that sit on the oh what what's it called? The Sco Scoville? Go, Scoville scale scale. <laughs> it's not super <laughs> hot. It's not like I mean if you took a shot of it, you'd probably hurt a little bit, but it's not really super hot. It's more vinegary. 
<laughs> that is awesome. Have you seen the YouTube show Hot Ones? No. Where oh. they really they eat really spicy things? Yeah, they literally go through like the the the, the Scoville scale for for hot sauces, and they get celebrities mm. on, and celebrities have to do all of these different hot sauces. It's hilarious. It's so funny. Just check that out. <laughs> the stuff that's on YouTube nowadays, I man! Know. Holy cow! <laughs> but he's got millions of viewers, and he's like, "What? Okay, that's that's insane." Awesome. So do you have any advice for others with chronic illness who want to go into the culinary profession before you go? Um, well, I think I'm not a doctor, right? So the first thing I would do would be to talk to your doctor. Um, if you're going to go into it, one thing that anybody needs to understand is that it's a commitment. Mm. That, um, And when you have a chronic illness, it's even more of a commitment because you know, you're going to feel a little bit more tired. You're going to feel more pain than a normal person. And even in the kitchen, the normal person feels quite a bit of pain and tiredness. So mm. um, getting into it, that's probably the most important thing is to understand what you're getting into. Um, fortunately, in the culinary industry, um, they have what they call stages or trails um, where you can actually Go into, you know, if you walked into a kitchen and told the chef there, I would like to work for you for free uh, for a little while, the, the chef would give you a hug and he'd give you, you know, he'd give <laughs> you a cutting board and a knife and say, go, go for it. You might not be doing the most exciting thing in the world, yeah. but you can get a feel for what it's like to be in a kitchen and work in a kitchen. And you could, you know, really understand what you're getting into before you're getting into it. Um, you know, one thing, chefs are always willing to take on extra labor if they can find it. That's um, incredible, because I, I would have thought that there's so many, like, regulations nowadays where you have to be, I don't know, health and safety tested or something stupid. <laughs> well, I don't know what it's like for you guys across the pond, but here, um, basically, the person in charge of the kitchen has to have a certification, and then anybody else, it's that person's responsibility. Oh, wow. So. I didn't know that. I wonder if that's the same here or whether that's different. I have no idea. I don't know. I'd like to find out one day. I really want to visit England one of these days, but yeah, that's oh, going to have to wait a little while. Yeah, it's uh, it's on my it's on my bucket list. It, it, really, England and uh, Asia are the two places I want to visit. Yes, I am desperate to go to Asia. Seriously, I'm just yeah. Like, oh, I want to just start at Japan or start at South Korea and just work my way down the whole coastline, basically. Yes. Yeah, totally. Because they have the most amazing food over there, don't they? They do. It's <laughs> my favorite type of food to cook and eat. Definitely. Really? <laughs> That's awesome. I'm pretty obsessed with ramen at the moment. Oh, do you have any there's... cooking tips for ramen? <laughs> ramen is pretty simple. I mean, I... It really is. <laughs> if you could find fresh ramen noodles, it's night and day over the dry ones. So yeah. that would be my first suggestion. And then, you know, you can make a really easy broth with you know garlic and ginger and you know chicken stock right out of the can and a little bit of uh soy sauce in it maybe a squeeze of lime and you got yourself a delicious stock and i always when i eat ramen i always fry an egg and i put it on top of it oh, so you can nice. cut into the egg and it just oozes into oh, yeah. the soup you know? that is the best that is literally the best thing ever so see you on part three thanks chris see you If you want to fight back against your invisible illness and help take the dis out of disability, then join the tribe on Facebook, facebook.com slash enabledwarriors. If you love this podcast, click that subscribe button and never miss another episode. And remember, warriors, stay enabled.